and welcome back to the Lighthouse Addictions Topic Show on Facebook Live. My name is Joan, I'm your host for today, and I'm here with um, Mr. Chuck. Hi Chuck, welcome, and we're very happy to have you. Um, so we're here every Thursday at 3 p.m. on Facebook.com slash Lighthouse Treatment. So please feel free at any time to ask questions or give us a shout out. You can comment below um, with anything that you have to say, and we'll be sure to um, check our comments periodically to uh, make sure that we respond to you. Also, please like and share our video, and also like our Facebook page, uh, the White House Treatment Center, uh, so that you're able to uh, see all of these um, talk shows that we have every week. We also post some motivational um, uh, posts, as well as informational blogs. So yeah, it's just a really cool page, uh, so make sure that you like it to check it out. So our topic for today is conflict resolution and crisis intervention and recovery. So please stay tuned for that. And here today we have Chuck, who is an employee at the White House. So what is your position at the White House? I'm the executive director Thanks. of the program. Nice. And what is it uh, that you do here? I oversee all the daily operations that, that happen within the, the Anaheim White House, House Treatment Center. Um, that involves everything from our operational parts, which is the daily function of uh, the treatment facility, overseeing the clinical aspects, that, that's our therapeutic and our counseling, and just the day-to-day -day running of a facility this size. So you're the person that makes sure that everything goes smoothly, and pretty much you supervise the entire facility. Yes. Okay, cool. So you're very, very important, so we're very happy to have you. You're a very special person um, here. So what are your happy um, moments? What are some of your happiest moments here? Well, I've only been at the lighthouse for this will be the fifth month, so um, I probably have a couple of really special ones. Probably our holiday season was probably the best one. You know, uh, a lot of effort was put into our Christmas functions and all oh, yeah. that we had for for not only our clients but their families, our alumni, and the staff. So that was a really special time. We had a lot of people here that that really pitched in and tried to make the day as special as possible. Oh, I think that's super important, especially on the holidays. Yeah. Um, for especially the clients to feel um, like they're in a safe environment, a loving environment. We, I think we have a comment. Okay, so we're just going to move on until my phone decides to work. Um, why have you decided to work in the field of addiction? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I spent actually 16 years addicted to drugs and alcohol myself. Um, oh my gosh. And um, I struggled for years and years trying to find a way forward and trying to, to get the affairs of my life sorted out. And so I finally ended up in a situation where I was kind of forced um, by a court order to, oh, to wow. seek treatment. And um, I had to go through quite an extensive period. I actually spent 14 months in treatment. 14 months. 14 months in treatment. Our clients got it very easy in 36 year landing day. But, right. um, and, but that, that program changed my life. It gave me a new perspective and it gave me a new calling to, to be able to reach out to people and help them through my own experience of addiction. So you really found your passion. Um, I'm calling through, and my passion. You're calling in your passion, especially from the experience that you, you mm -hmm. yourself had. So wow. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. That with us, I know that's something a little bit intimate for you to share, it's but... Not, you know, to me, you know, to go, I mean, some people might feel it's very intimate, but it's it's the power behind the message of what most of us in this industry do to help others. Most of, a lot of people within this industry have had their own experience with addiction, and part of the passion that comes out of, uh, around helping other people is from their own experience. And so it's, it's not a badge of honor, but it's a badge of, respect that I had for the path that I took, you know, with my addiction, but all the things that led me out of addiction are the things that I use now to help others to find freedom in their life. Absolutely. And just uh, on that, uh, I like you mentioned, you haven't been here for, for that long, like maybe half a year, but, uh, you know, uh, you really brought a warm energy to the facility, and I just wanted to say if you or your loved one is considering um, coming into treatment with our program specifically, I just want you guys to, to feel confident that um, our facility is supervised by a very um, informed, um, a very experienced, and 
qualified person um, the conflict? Well, I think when you, you look at the different, um, the, the diversity of our clients and our program, you know, we can have our, our, our people from a Caucasian background, Hispanic background, maybe Oriental, they, they all approach conflict slightly different. Some are a little bit more vocal in the way that they approach conflict. Some are a little bit more forward. Some have to uh, bear in mind honor and respect mm. and, and maybe the position that they have within, within the cultural aspect. Um, I think the family origin always has a, a big part, not just in the communication, but how families look at the future. Absolutely. It's because some families, maybe who are maybe first or second generation from from another company, may not un truly, truly understand what addiction is. And then they find out that their loved one is involved in addiction, and they don't necessarily know what resources are available, who to turn to, or maybe their own cultural identity causes them to maybe um, exclude themselves to, from some of those resources because of embarrassment or because it might bring dishonor to the culture, the family of origin. That's something actually I've experienced myself. Being an Asian uh, woman uh, in recovery, I am the minority here. Um, so I'm being told that we do have um, some comments, but I'm not able to, to see them right now. So one second, please. Okay, so we have Nancy saying, welcome back, Joe, and hi, Chuck. Um, and Heather wants to know about scholarships. And I'm not exactly sure uh, what kind of question you have about scholarships, Heather. Um, maybe what qualifies or? Well, I, I, I can speak to that to a certain degree. Okay. Um, you know, the, this company has a, um, a program where they, they try to invest back into people who maybe don't have the resources, maybe through their insurance company or maybe have cash to be able to, to seek uh, help for themselves or their, or, or their loved one. The, the owners of this company have been very generous and at times they give us the opportunity to make scholarships. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's based upon our population, what, what resources are available, but at times we do have scholarships available. Somebody would just have to reach out to maybe yourself or one of our other representatives and we can always discuss that. We can always look at that opportunity and see if that's, that's a possibility. Thank you. I know even for some of our alumni, you granted them a scholarship. They've been very, very grateful. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's really important for them to have that second chance in their recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, going back to, you know, um, culture, and stuff, there's a stigma, especially in the Asian um, culture, where there's no women um, that are addicted. That's like completely unheard of. And because of that, it took me a very long time to actually ask mm -hmm. my family for help. Um, but I was very happy I did because uh, they ended up being very supportive. But even in my work here, they were a little bit hesitant for me to tell my friends or my other relatives that I work in treatment because of the fact that I have experience um, in addiction myself. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's just my little experience. Um, so can you uh, can people develop different conflict styles? I think you know as as we grow up, we watch family dynamics. We look at different ways that our parents interact, we look at how our siblings interact, we obviously learn things at school about how to develop a style of conflict that fits us. Sometimes that's based upon a personal choice, sometimes it's based upon the way that um, a person <laughs> feels about themselves. You know, Some people might be downright aggressive, they're very vocalized in the way that they approach conflict, always let the people know exactly where they're at and how they feel. Others can be a bit more passive in the fact that they walk around being um, distant, moody, petulant, kind of, and they, they're sending a message, but nobody's hearing the message. And then you have some who just withdraw from conflict, and that's a message in itself. They, they distance themselves from friends, family, loved ones, school systems, or the support around them as a way of trying to say, you know what, I'm hurting, I, I need help, but don't have the words or the vocalization skills to be able to actually ask for that. So there's many different forms of uh, conflict. It, it, when somebody's not hearing the message you're trying to send, there's usually some form of conflict. That is very, very true. And can you discuss the types of communications that are effective when dealing with a person in addiction uh, regarding conflicts? It, this is probably one of the more complex. I, I've been doing this work for over 22 years. Oh, wow. I've done this work all around the world. And 
one of the things that you find is that um, before a person even probably ends up addicted, a certain style of communication happens within the family dynamic. Yeah. You know, some some families might need to yell at each other just to because that's the way that they communicate. That's very Others cool. avoid topics. Um, so some of the patterns of, of communication for a lot of families are laid down before a loved one ever ends up in addiction. Once a person ends up in addiction, um, there tends to be a lot of the, the lies and the deceptions and the hurts and the wounds that take place um, within that family dynamic, and so it turns into more confrontational stuff. Once a person actually starts to want to make a change in their life, one of the hardest parts is learning how to communicate effectively with the loved ones around them, to rebuild those relationships that are based upon love and trust and, and a certain amount of respect for the other person. Um, one of the problems is that often the, the people that have been wounded by the loved ones addiction are still trapped in the old model of communication. Why their loved ones may be in a, in a treatment facility like ours learning some new, healthier ways of trying to communicate. Their family is still trapped in the old, the old method of trying to communicate. So now their loved one comes back home mm -hmm. and reintegrates back into their life, and they pick up where they left off. Right. And that, that's one of the hardest things, is to for the family to, to get the kind of communication skills that are necessary to support their loved one. They can't pick up at the last hook. That is very true. You know, um, one of the things that I encourage when I work with families is that you know your your loved one is making a significant change in their life, and you have to you have to deal with them where they're at, not Absolutely. where they were. Right. If, right. If, if your conversation is always salted or peppered with um, the the things that they've done in the past, the, the the person who's trying to overcome their addiction is still trapped there by the words of others. Absolutely. But it's very if, painful. If yeah. if today is my first day back in my family, I want you to respect where I'm at and try to work with me where I'm at so that we can build new ways of communicating, new ways of interacting within our relationship. Not how I was a month ago or six months ago, but how I am now. And not, you know, I always encourage families that, you know, you can't bring old wounds, old hurts into a new life. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, they need the opportunity to be successful. Encourage them where they're at then. You know, you might communicate at what you are going to accept and what you're not going to accept that, that is a healthy boundary. But that's where it should be done. And then allow that person to uh, grow or, or re-emerge into the person that they want to become, not who they used to be. So um, just touching on that, would you encourage families or loved ones um, to attend like Al-Anon or, or codependency meetings? Uh, everybody, we, we bring clients in here to educate them to, to provide therapy, to, to maybe deal with past wounds and hurts and the counseling sessions. All that is about the education that they're going to need to be successful in their own recovery. Families need that also. You know, whether it's a mother or father, uh, siblings, whether it's a wife or a husband, and, and sometimes depending on the age of the children, we always encourage things like that. You need as much information and as much knowledge about how this disease works and how to deal with it so that when your loved one does come home, you can be supportive, mm -hmm. you can be encouraging, but you can also keep them accountable. Yeah, and set healthy boundaries for them as well. Yeah, because, you know, most of us, you know, when we see a loved one hurting, our love becomes the predominant emotion, which sometimes leads to anger, but we want to love somebody better, and we end up enabling them in their addiction. And having healthy boundaries says that I love you, there are limitations to what I'm going to do to support you. My love may never disappear, but I'm not going to continue to enable you to cause hurt, harm, or danger to my family or our family. Thank you so much for that. And can you discuss types of communications that are ineffective when dealing with a person in addiction? Well, um, accusatory. Ones oh. where there are um, the old hurts, the old wounds, the things that were done in the past are constantly back up in, in, in a person's face. If a person has made a sincere commitment to their own recovery and gone through one of the most difficult challenges of their life, getting clean and addressing some of the underlying issues that cause that addiction, um, they need to be treated with where they're at. Yeah. I think I mentioned this a little bit before. Now, I want to be 
be dealt with with where I'm at, not where I was. Absolutely. Maybe at some point in the future we can have a healthy discussion about some of the things that went on in the past. But those are usually not in the early days of a person's recovery or somebody being into a recovery plan. So we always encourage, I always encourage family members, you know, when your loved one comes home, be, be curious hmm. to the point of, you know what, try to figure out, you know, what was your experience like? Yeah. You know, um, don't focus on failures, focus on the successes, focus on the things where you grew and where uh, a new life began to emerge. Those, those are the things that everybody can feel excited about. If we only concentrate on the failures, the hurts in the past, then, then communication tends to break down. The old wounds are ripped back open, and before long, you know, it, it, we're back to where we were before. We're yelling and screaming at each other, yeah. we are, you know, distancing ourselves. And, and for the person who's new to their recovery, those are all the triggers that often lead to um, a person have to be emotional response to a situation where they don't like, and they spend so much time teaching their brain that when I feel this way, I want to avoid it, so they want to go use. Um, as much as the, the, the family can be constructive in the way that they, they, they uh, um, communicate, use lots of open ended questions that who, what, when, where, and why, mm -hmm. and, and, and do lots of confirmation asking those closed questions so that there is clear understanding. Sometimes when there's not understanding, we always encourage our loved ones to paraphrase that. Repeat it back to your loved one, the way you, the way you heard it. Because what the person said and what the person hears can often be two different things. But when somebody can paraphrase it back, then there's an interpretation. This is what I thought I heard you say. It might be right or it might be wrong. But it gives us a chance for the clarification. Thank you so much for that. And what are some resources that may help a family learn how to better um, communicate with someone who's addicted? I know we said Al Anon and um, Codependence Anonymous, is that what you Well, there's CODA, with CODA, there we go. CODA, which is a codependency group, uh, which a lot of families do have kind of built into the, uh, the relationship dynamics is a certain amount of codependency. Um, there's, there's tons of resources. We're, we're so blessed nowadays to have uh, things like the internet, otherwise we wouldn't be having this opportunity, but there's so many resources out there that you can use to, to, to get access to better ways of communication. You walk into any bookstore and, and find a, a ton of information on how you can develop this. It, it is about that educational aspect. It is about the hunger and the desire that how do I support my loved one? Mm. If I was willing to support them in their addiction, what would I be doing? support them in their recovery. That is very true. I've never thought about it like that before. And what skills are the clients learning to effectively communicate when they go home? So um, we have a, a multitude of different groups that try to address the communication styles and some of the emotions that are generated by their communication. Uh, things like anger management, you know, teach them how to, you know, how to understand the emotions that they're actually, actually experiencing and then the, um, how am I going to manage that particular emotion? Is it going to be something that I'm going to yell and scream about, or is it something I'm going to maybe step back, process, and think of a way? How do I communicate my needs? Um, uh, we, we look at different forms of communication, how to communicate within the family unit or family groups. Um, you know, having a better understanding of uh, people's uh, their own behavior and the impact on it gives them a way to communicate in a healthy matter because if I recognize the damage I'm doing by my behavior, then if I if I can stop doing my behavior, then that's one less area of conflict that I have to, to maybe address through my communication. It can be more positive, it can be more supportive and creative. I communicate with the people around me, make my amends or to rebuild those bridges in the way that the, the family receives that communication when they can actually be much more supportive and Thank you so much. Um, what skills have you acquired while you have worked with clients um, with addiction? Um, like I said earlier, um, I've spent 22 years in this industry. I've done this all around the world. Um, one of the key things I found is that addiction is addiction. It doesn't matter whether somebody walks through the door addicted to heroin, crack, cocaine, pornography, or cake. You know, um, <laughs> addiction is addiction. And you know, through all these years, I've learned that you know everybody has a broken heart. I've met or met an addict in my life that doesn't have uh, a wounded heart in some way, shape, or form. And 
it's always one of my personal messages to our warm clients is that there is something not that, that runs side by side with our, our sobriety, and that is freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and freedom from the reasons that cause me to feel what the particular is I, I do as an addict. And if I can find a sense of freedom from those issues, and sometimes that's our history, the things that life did to us, the way people treated us, the things we did in our addiction, uh, the decisions we made. Once those issues have um, been challenged, confronted, and a, and a place of healing is, then the person not only attains sobriety, but they, they attain a sense of freedom. And that freedom is often the thing that makes them now really get excited about their life. Because I can be, I could, I could be clean from a substance, but still feel the way I did while I was an addict. And for a lot of people early in their addiction, that's one of the reasons they often go back to the substance and keep relapsing or going in and out of treatment is that I was clean from the substance, but I still felt rotten. I still felt like rubbish on the inside. But then when a person finds that sense of freedom, they, they can begin to actually begin to enjoy that. The wounds help make the person who they are, but they do not have to be designed to that <laughs> Yeah, I remember one of our clients um, here actually said that recovery was the moment where they realized that life was actually worth living. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really nice. Um, so we have Anita uh, joining us. Thanks for joining us, Anita. And she says Chuck is an awesome character. <laughs> so I think you have a few fans. <laughs> so uh, ACAs are actually, it's, it's similar to what AMAs are. Um, in hospitals, which means against medical advice, so ACA means against clinical advice, and this sometimes happens um, when clients decide to leave before um, their estimated discharge date, or you know before we we suggest them to leave. Um, so, can you tell me what a typical ACA looks like and how you personally deal with that type of situation? Well, there's lots of different varieties of ACAs. Um, most people at some point in their journey and, and treatment begin to feel, sometimes they, they start to feel better. They, they maybe go through a period of detox and maybe five, seven days, sometimes maybe a little, little bit longer, where they're starting to feel better in their body. And the moment that they start to feel better in their body, they start to think, well, now all of a sudden, all those things that I wasn't taking care of, my car payment, mm -hmm. my house, and my children, or or my marriage, or my relationship, or you know, the plumbing, or something. <laughs> like that. They'll make all kinds of reasons to, to think, okay, I'm better now. I've got to go. I've seen that quite often. Um, you know, and it's just another way that our this disease tricks our brain into creating what we call justification systems mm -hmm. that, that that basically prop up the, our decision making process around why we do certain things. Um, so sometimes ACAs happen in those early days when people start to feel better um, physically. Um, sometimes as they get a little bit longer in the program, you know, this is, this is hard work. Every day is a challenge. I tell all of our clients that the only easy day in treatment was yesterday. Mm. If you're feeling comfortable today, then something's wrong. Right. Because you're not pushing yourself. You're not digging deep enough. You're not exploring some of the things that have influenced your addiction. Um, and enough to actually make yourself uncomfortable that day. Um, so because of the amount of hard work that, that this requires, mental, physical, emotional, for a lot of people this is a very spiritual experience for them, um, it becomes strange. Sit through groups all day and then you know, constantly kind of be an usher or a shepherd and go here, do this, get in the van, go here, pee in a cup, you know. It, 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 it becomes uh, quite exhausting. You know, and at that point, clients want to look to a way out. They want to look for a way to try to get away from this. Yeah. Or they're beginning to um, confront a lot of the emotions that maybe they've spent a long time in their life. Um, when a person wants to leave, um, we usually we, we try to rally around it as a, as a team. Everything from our support staff to getting um, their clinicians, like the therapist and the counselor involved. Yay. If they have particular people that um, that might have, might have been involved in referring them, that might be anything from um, professionals to um, family members. We try to get them involved in, in in trying to have a conversation. We want to get everybody involved. We want everybody to have a piece of the conversation. We want everybody to um, have a say so in what's going to happen. For 
some of those, um, for some of those people, it, especially the families. Mm -hmm. Families are so important in, in the process of trying to get a person to consider, you know, because a lot of them think I'm just going to go home and live with mom and dad. You know, I'm going to go back to a wife or a husband who's already been put up with this. And sometimes they're, they're the ones who need to, to have to set some boundaries mm -hmm. because we'll support them in their family decisions by keeping their, their loved one here and trying to. Thank you. Uh, when a client is trying to leave again, kind of like bias, what may be the reason? Well, you already touched that they're already feeling comfortable, um, that they're good physically. Uh, what are other reasons do you think? Um, sometimes it's the issues, you know, some, you know, not, I, I think sometimes the, there's a stereotype of the type of person who's in treatment that uh, most of them are unemployed, they have no jobs, no responsibilities. Mm -hmm. well, we, we, you know, probably if we're 30, 40, 30 or 40 percent of our population at times are employed. They have jobs, they have homes, they have bills, they have responsibilities, they have child care issues. And those become very pressing. You know, we try to get clients to to um, make a commitment in the early days of their treatment to either be here 30, 60, or 90 days to, to be able to make a dedication to their life and to the lives of their loved ones. And then we try to hold them accountable. Because day 21 might look very different than day 22. But if on day 22 I want to go home, well, there's plenty of reasons to go home. There's plenty of reasons why we, as uh, at least for me as a former addict, I, I could find plenty of reasons to get home. The sun came up on the wrong side, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I, my shoes didn't fit right. You know, I don't have the right color of socks. You know, there's, there's plenty of reasons why people will find to get home. But when a person wants to AC, find a reason why they want to stay. Absolutely. Why they want to save their life and, and, and preserve everything that's, that they, that's so important to them back home. Their family, their loved ones, their children, their home, maybe their employment. All those things, they need to be reminded of. And so we put as many barriers and as many questions in their head. Is this the right decision? Absolutely. And, and most of the time when they decide to stay, they're really happy about it. Yeah. And here's the scenario. What if a client comes in for detox and after their detox, uh, we're kind of convinced that they stay to treatment. Um, but they say, no, I'm not as bad as these other guys or these other clients. I'm not even an alcoholic or an addict. I just needed to sober up for a few days. What would your, how would you um, encourage um, or convince that client to stay? And what, what do you think you Um, in my own addiction, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess, but I thought I just partied. <laughs> right. You know, um, <laughs> but when you spend hundreds of dollars every night on habit, when mm. you don't go to sleep for days at a time, when, mm. when you've lost a home, a marriage, and, and relationships, and, and everything that has any value to you, that's not partying anymore. That's, that's addiction. Most people who start out with <clears throat> addiction start out having it starts out as a social um, exercise you do with friends, you have a few laughs and everything. Some people can leave it at that, you know. Um, but other people, it helps to remedy maybe um, internal conflicts, mm -hmm. mental, physical, emotional, sometimes spiritual conflicts for them. It helps to distance them from those pains or, or those emotions that they're struggling with. And then it becomes a daily thing. It becomes a part of it. But at that point, there, there usually starts to, I always define addiction as the moment that it starts to cause you pain, you're an addict. If you, if you didn't make it to work one day because you overused, that's pain. That's if you now happen to lie to your employer, to your teachers, to your children, to your spouse, uh, to, your, to your parents, that's pain. That, that now you have all the qualities that make them an addict. And whether a person uses heroin, alcohol, something the doctor prescribes, you know, um, it's not what you use, it's the reason why you use a substance is the key to, to identifying whether you're an addict. I can eat too much chocolate cake for all the wrong reasons. That would be an addict. I could eat terrible in the same way. You know, it, it's really about the reasons why a person uses a substance. It's the reason you can have uh, whether or not they're an addict. And 
some people do come in thinking, you know what, I only need to drink on the weekends. I'm not like the heroin addict. I'm not like the, the person who smokes crack. I, I, I'm not like them. And your social and economic situation might be very different. Your background, the color of your skin, your culture might be very different. But at the end of the day, if you misuse a substance for all the wrong reasons to help you alleviate your physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual pain, and that there might be varying degrees of that, but you still have all the reasons for to, to, uh, to um, you know, have a level of um, treatment and to, to address some of those issues. And like you said, it doesn't matter what your drug of choice or your poison is. Mm -hmm. um, an addiction is an addiction. And they have a saying in AA, from Park Bench to Park Avenue or mm -hmm. something, it doesn't matter, like you were saying, you're your status, your social status, your economic status, or anything like addiction does not discriminate. Um, yeah, um, you know, people will find uh, a drug and escape, use it to escape their lives or escape escape the inner turmoil that they've been dealing with because they don't know uh, the right coping mechanisms to deal with those things. Thank you very much. Um, can other clients be part of the process to help clients when they're struggling? One of the, there's a, a several principles that I try to get uh, clients to actually live by while they're here. One of those is brotherhood and sisterhood. Oh yeah, I always tell the alumni that. Yeah, you know, um, our clients come from all over the country. They come from different backgrounds, different social and economic experiences. From different, they have different colors of skin, different cultural beliefs, different um, belief systems. But for whatever reason, they all end. Right. Most of these clients in the normal world would not, never have anything to do with each other. <laughs> but here, they are all of a sudden, we throw them together and they're forced to live in each other's back pockets, spend countless hours with each other, spend lots of time listening to their stories and their experiences, their pains, their successes. And, um, but this is their family. This is, for this season in their life, this is their family. So we always encourage you. You may not always get along with each other, but you know you're, you have each other to support, help, and encourage each other. And sometimes, you know, and I've seen this many, many times, that sometimes the person who is always there pushing your button, whining you up, making you know they're the pain in your backside, they're the ones who you know when I'm really struggling, might step in and all of a sudden have one word of wisdom. They might say one sentence to you. They might be the very person who demonstrates that sense of care concern for me that changes my whole mentality. So having that sense of brotherhood or sisterhood is really important because it's the clients spend more time with each other and talking to each other. And the conversations that they'll have when staff aren't present are very different than the ones they'll have when they are present. So often they become a big source of encouragement. I might draw, you know, you might share your story with me and I'm struggling today and I find one little tidbit from your own personal journey that somehow helps me turn that corner that day. It, and tomorrow it might be somebody else's story that helps me get through. And so much of this uh, overcoming this disease is just one day at a time. Absolutely. I just eat what I need to get through today. You know, I don't sit down and eat for the week, but I, I eat for the day. Mm. And sometimes that's, that comes from that sense of community of help and support. Thank you so much. So we have a few more people that are joining. Thank you, Jackie, for joining. Isaac said, good to see you back, Joe. Thank you, Isaac. And he also said, great job, Chuck. <laughs> so you have a lot of fans. <laughs> OK, so um, what is the biggest key to helping a client stay sober? Well, we talked a lot about family, um, family involvement, family support, and family accountability. Um, but you know, so much of, this, uh, of what we do here has a basis around things like celebrate recovery, mm -hmm. the 12 step community. Um, the strength of your support outside of treatment is, is going to be the deciding factor on whether or not you're going to you're going to maintain your sobriety. Absolutely. You know, having a strong support network uh, within the 12 step, we, we encourage people to get a sponsor, somebody who's not just going to be a friend or a buddy, but somebody who's going to you know, hold you accountable, somebody who's going to challenge you, somebody who's going to call you on your, your mess when they need to. You're stuck. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, within the, you know, if it's a faith-based approach that you're utilizing, then 
do things like having um, uh, somebody to disciple you or mentor you or, or you know, having your church or, or your faith-based community surround you with the same type of support. But then again, you need somebody that's going to hold you accountable, somebody that's going to be there to, to kind of work with you. And usually those are people that can't be family members. Family plays a different role than a sponsor or a mentor or, or, or somebody who's going to disciple you. So um, we, we always encourage that. Having a sense of fellowship because they, they go from this community hopefully into a new community and they'll have their their own home groups and they'll have they'll have people there that, that, that partner with them and walk along this journey with them some with the same amount of experience and some maybe with greater experience but it's that partnership of, uh, and that sense of community that, that becomes kind of like a set of shock absorbers in their life help them ride out the difficult uh, little parts of the road thank you so much Chuck. I could tell just from this interview and knowing you for um, the short time that we have known each other that you have such a great passion for what you do. And uh, I'm sure we all can appreciate that. So we're just going to, uh, we're actually going to wrap it up in a little bit. I just wanted to ask you um, one more question. Do you have any advice that you'd like to um, say to somebody who's struggling or even family members that have a loved one who is addicted? I think the, the hardest part for the person who's struggling with addiction is really, you know, Acknowledging the fact that I need help. This is one of the hardest things that a person will ever do in their life, is mm -hmm. get clean. And one of the hardest parts of that is actually acknowledging the fact that I need help. Mm -hmm. And reaching out to the people around them. And that might be your family, that might be a loved one, it might be a friend. It might be somebody who you only briefly know, but maybe who has been through this journey themselves, that can, you know what, stand there and advocate with might know that I have insurance that might help my loved one, but not know who to call. And, you know, um, and if people aren't sure, you know, there we, we have a, a host of resources. Check out our website. We've, we've got a number of different resources available. We've got numbers if you want to talk to somebody face-to-face -face that, that, that will literally, you know, maybe answer some of your questions, guide you through the whole process so that you can make an informed decision or work in partnership with your loved one who has it. Thank you so much for being here. I thank you um, for sharing your experience, your time. Um, I just wanted to remind you all that we are here every Thursday at 3 p.m. on facebook.com slash lighthouse treatment. This is the Lighthouse Addictions topic show. And once again, I am your host. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.